The Ukraine aid package has cleared the Senate, paving the way for the president's signature. And is it coming at just the right time for Ukraine? I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. We're going to talk about all of it. Plus, we're going to see just why Russia wants to pretend this aid package doesn't really exist. Let's get into it. Okay, so the biggest news first off uh, is that the frontline situation has changed in some insignificant ways and some significant ways. Russia remains firmly on the offensive, um, and you can see them making pretty marginal advances right here in uh, Hyrovka. Uh, you can see them advancing maybe a block or so. Um, you can also see, of course, in this town of uh Semenivka, this is actually the most significant frontline changes here. And I, I want to cluster these three major changes here at Novo Bamotivka and Semenivka. And the reason I think they're significant is not necessarily because there's a ton of advance happening in any given direction, but this is what I what worries me. You can see here, Russian forces are up to, but not quite past this Ukrainian defensive line formed by this reservoir and canal system. But you can see, as of today, they are into the town of Semenivka proper. And they're also past Berdichy. So you can see that this is a real problem for uh, Ukrainian forces who have been maintaining this as a defensive line uh, from Umansky, Semenivka uh, to Berdichy. And the fact that now Russia is past it means that while they have an uphill battle ahead of them, um, and it's it, they are through the hardest obstacle that they are going to have to overcome here, which is this major river system, right? Crossing it under fire. And they've managed to do so, which may indicate to me that while I uh, speculated, I was actually pretty sure that Ukraine uh, wasn't yet, was had... Ukraine would have enough artillery shells to step up its artillery burn rate pending the delivery of U.S. shells. I may have been incorrect, right? I assumed that that Ukraine would be able to add a zero to its shell expenditure per day in the face of this advance, but it seems like that's not the case. And you can see it's been coupled with an expansion of the Russian perimeter in Ochteretina and Novobotmotivka, which we've talked about again. Russia's ability to carve out a, a block here, a block there, um, is really good. Um, it has a much harder time crossing large swaths of open ground. Um, but you can see that's where they've made these advances in most cases. But in this instance, right near Novo, my uh, Novo Kalyanova, uh, they've advanced all the way up to this tree line here, crossing some open ground in a prime an effort to encircle this Karamik. But you can see that Russian forces are taking their gains wherever they can get them. And while they are, while most of the reporting says that Russia wants to take Chasiv Yar by the 9th, um, most of the, the battlefield reality tells us that they're actually more focused on breaking this Berdichy Semenivka Umansky line. And they may do so. Now, the, the thinking is that. Ukraine may withdraw and reestablish another line here, Sokil, Voskhod, uh, and then south uh, all the way to this. Uh, river here or this lake here um, near Kalinova. And that could work for them. But again, Ukraine has this, there's this retreating problem that you have. And that problem is that defensive lines need a lot of time to be set. And what can often happen is that when you establish a really strong defensive position using things like minefields and, and obstacles, that you end up locking yourself into a position, if that makes sense, right? Because it's hard for the enemy to cross a minefield to get to you or cross an obstacle, but it's also hard for you to cross back over. Now, it's slightly easier because, again, you're going to know the routes through the minefield, whereas the Russians are going to have to discover the routes through the minefield the hard way, but it still forces your your forces to be canalized and it impedes the ability to conduct uh, broad counterattacks. Uh, so overall, again, this aid package cannot come at a better time for Ukraine. Um, and the Senate, I want to point out, Senate voted 80 to 19 on Tuesday uh, afternoon, right, to break a filibuster uh, and send this $95 billion paid aid package to a final vote on the the floor of the Senate. This is the last hurdle. Um, 
and seems extremely likely to pass. Um, again, uh, all the MAGA Republicans absolutely in full Stephen Cope mode. Uh, Senator Mike Lee just calling uh, the Ukraine funding massively controversial without elaborating uh, and said that there should be debate rather than a rubber stamp, which, of course, uh, by insisting, but you cannot claim that stopping a filibuster is the same thing as allowing debate. Um, and Mike Lee claims he just needs 41 senators, just 40% of the Senate, and we can kill this bill. Uh, so, you know, these people are idiots. Um, but it seems like this is going to make it to Joe Biden's desk for signature. And Defense One covering just what that will entail. The first tranche already been identified as the absolutely critically needed billion dollars worth of uh, 155 shells, anti-tank and anti-aircraft missiles, as well as long range rocket and some armored vehicles for Kazavak. Uh, and this is going to get pushed as fast as possible. Um, and the administration, as they point out, uh, is not going to be sending another aid package right before the election. This battle needs to have a pin put in it uh, electorally for the United States, uh, certainly for the president. Um, but uh, the Ukraine, or at least the Ukrainian military, uh, is in dire need of some of these items. Uh, but there's got to figure out how to spread this out because uh, some of this aid is going to go needs to go towards immediate needs, right? Because as I always point out, that it doesn't matter if you are not around to fight in 2025, then it doesn't matter like what you have, you know. So if they lose the war in 2024, then there's no reason to worry about 2025, right? Uh, but Ukraine needs to figure out how to set aside some for the future for a future counteroffensive uh but also it needs to stabilize the frontline situation now and we've seen that ukraine has the two key elements that it needs most which thanks to the changing uh draft law and they're finally implementing some policies to uh, encourage, we'll say, um, Ukrainian military age men who've fled the country uh, to return home uh, and serve in their military. Right. So their hope is that between these two policies, between they'll add about four hundred thousand soldiers to the battlefield, obviously phased in over time, uh, and then they'll be able to arm and equip those soldiers with this robust defense spending package. That is the the hope and. You know, a lot of the negative Nancys prognosticating on the the, the fall of Ukraine, uh, I think these reforms will enable it to do so, um, right? They point out that heavy Ukrainian losses in this failed summer offensive suggests it says any future attacks must be well-resourced in terms of soldier equipment and munitions. I think it's more likely that the focus of the war strategy is going to have to look attritional. And we're going to talk in a second about why. But first off, if you know anything about this channel, you know that YouTube in an election year, they do not like uh, with, with independent commentators like me, um, saying what covering the news, basically, they don't like me covering conflict news. I'm trying to, I'm, I keep trying to do things the nice way and I just can't, um, YouTube, they, uh, so they often view these sort of conflicts as liabilities, as you've seen. Certainly there's a reason I, I can't even touch Israel, Gaza, won't even talk about it because YouTube is so, the algorithm is so crushing against it. Um, but even this conflict, sponsors do not want to touch me. So I depend on you guys is, is the point I'm getting at. And that there's a lot of content that I can't put here on YouTube. That's why I created Combat Vet News. It, 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 it's a win-win for everybody, right? It enables you guys to directly support the channel um, with a, a and, and just five bucks a month will get you access to the twice a week uncensored combat footage analysis. And I find the most recent stuff from the front line. I'm actually working to try to maybe get some exclusive content uh, from units themselves, but, but that's still sort of in the works. But we are trying to get this, we get twice a week, these combat videos. Um, I do a deep dive analysis and it really gives us insights that you can't get anywhere else. For example, last week we saw just how desperate Ukraine was and how heavily they were relying on drones because one, the only combat footage was drone footage and they were resorting to dropping 
anti-tank mines out of drones that had been rigged up to explode. And they were dropping them on infantry, which is so weird. But if you want to support the channel even more, the lieutenant tier, the colonel tier, those make a tremendous difference, guys. I really can't tell you enough. They're the thing that enables me and the team to continue to do this. So thank you guys that are members. Um, and if you're interested, you should definitely become a member on combatvetnews.com, especially now as this Ukraine aid package hits. We're going to see how it gets implemented on the battlefield. Hopefully we see a lot more artillery. We see a lot more cluster munitions. We see a lot more uh, deep strike targets. Um, so here's what I thought was the most interesting. It's one of the reasons why Russia worked so hard to stop this aid package is that, you know, one of the comments, the Russian trolls have changed their nature a little bit. They've changed their talking points. And one of the big ones is mathematically, it's impossible for Ukraine to win. And I just wanted to see what is the math? And when I looked at it, this is what fascinated me. So bear in mind, guys, the U.S. alone, the U.S. alone just passed an aid package for about 60 to 60 to 70 billion dollars for Ukraine. In 2022, right? Russia's military budget was around 75 billion. Now, I, I point this out because remember, the Russian military still runs an entire nuclear arsenal, has a large naval fleet, a shrinking but still very large, and a huge conscript army that by Russian law is prohibited from serving in Ukraine. So I say that because the entire Russian defense budget, now it's ramped up a lot. And how much? Uh, well, in 2023, the thinking is it's around $100 billion of defense spending. So you understand how this aid package is a disaster for them because literally the U.S.'s contribution alone would represent, would put Ukraine, even if Ukraine didn't spend a dime of their own money and that no other European country helped in any way, it would still represent an 80% or sorry, a 70% closing of the gap between the Ukrainian defense budget and the Russian defense budget. Now, what's even more interesting is that CIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, which is a nice way of talking about a defense, <laughs> defense think tank, um, estimated the Russian defense budget at $140 billion, Right. So Russia ramping up, but here's the thing. Remember, still 50% of that gap has already been closed by U.S. aid to Ukraine. And the U.K. Allow, announced their largest aid package, right? A half a billion dollars. And other European countries are also contributing uh, considerably. So Ukraine is going to be looking at a really, really quickly closing gap here. Um, and Russia, remember, this defense spending, to put things in perspective, is... 35% of all government spending. So basically, they are maintaining enough to keep some of their basic services functioning within their government, and the rest is going to this war. And for perspective, right? Ukraine aid as a percent of GDP, for the United States, we have spent a absolutely paltry Right. This is how this is how affordable this is. It's not paltry. We've again, this is why people worry so much about the United States. When you look at a percentage of their total gross domestic product, so not quite the same thing as total government spending, the United States has contributed not one percent, point three two percent. Point three two percent of our total GDP has gone to Ukraine aid. 5% of our defense budget, not all government spending, our defense budget. So this is why, this is, this is why Russia worries about this because literally 35% of government spending is a, is a, a society collapsing amount. This is, this is, that is the level of spending that preceded the fall of the Soviet Union. It's the level of spending that generally precedes countries right before they, uh, collapse because even if they can sustain the war the cracks in civil society that have to happen to make that occur are intolerable for lengths of time right you're going to see hospitals without medicine you're going to see uh retirees the one of putin's absolute core bases they're not going to get their retiree pension or they're going to have to have the pension um dollar or, or basically eaten away with inflation right russia's gonna have to print money to pay everyone driving inflation at an unbelievable level but 
the point is that a war of attrition is not a crazy strategy because Russia just is spending at a level that is a society ending level. So, and again, for the U.S., this is a uh, uh, matching that spending is a trivially easy matter. Trivially easy. Bare, you, you, you won't even notice it, right? Like of every one of your tax dollars, uh, I think like two cents would go to Ukraine this year. Two pennies of every one of your tax dollars. Nothing. So anyway, uh, that I think is an important scale uh, discussion. But anyway, guys, that's all I had. Thanks so much to our Colonel tier members. Thanks to our Lieutenant tier members. I really could not do this without you guys. And I will see you guys in the next one. Cheers.